Good evening. Well, here we are again. Thank you very much for your attendance, either here in person or via streaming. Well, we are going to discuss today one of the most concerning, challenging and exciting subjects to discuss climate change. Well, as you know, we are here talking about the challenges for the future, and this is one of the greatest challenges, because it involves the whole planet. This is not about war or about democratic systems, but rather the survival of the planet. This is a very serious issue, and of course, as such, we thought hard and long about who should we invite. Fernando Valladares is sitting here next to me. He is pretty well known, he is an excellent uh, communicator. Sometimes we are very good at uh, communicating in the classrooms, but not so much when we are outside the classrooms. But this is not the case with Fernando. He is a professor of biology, a researcher at the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas. He is also the director of the Biology and Global Change Department at the Museum of Natural Sciences. And he's also an activist. He's a part of the Scientists' Rebellion movement, which is a rebellion with a cause. And uh, we have an Agnès Delage, Amat, who is a professor of history. And she is even more of an activist than Fernando. She tries to send a message of concern to everyone about climate change if we maintain our lifestyle. This will raise many issues, of course. We're here to listen to what the two speakers have to say. I'm going to give the floor to Fernando first, then to Agnes. And then we will open the floor for questions. So, without any further ado, Fernando, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you today. This is a difficult subject, a very tough subject. I'm going to try to approach it from an ironic perspective. Occasionally, I just want to diagnose the situation. I will just uh, paint uh, some uh, general brush strokes of what is the current situation, and then I will hand it over to Agnes, but I'm going to prepare the ground so that Agnes can focus on the social issues of this subject, of which she is an expert. Well, 
va unas veces sí, otras veces no, lo cual lo puede hacer un poco más complicado. O sea, la puedo dar sin, sin apoyo, pero no, se no, pierden no, algunos sí. datos. Sí, esto en todo caso es un minuto. Yo creo que igual es la batería. Voy, voy arrancando porque hay muchos temas que okay, podemos ir start. De, de la, En la presentación arranco por una de varias formas de abordar el cambio I'm just going to asuntos es que somos mucha gente. No escapa a nadie. One of the es verdad que ya no crecemos tan deprisa como crecíamos antes, pero There's seguimos creciendo. Too many of us in y this cuando se cometen errores, fact. siendo We 500 grow. millones de personas, pues no se nota mucho. Pero very fast. So when you, we've always been growing population in history, but when we are 500 million people in the planet, the mistakes are not really that serious. But when there's a 8 billion of us in the planet, we make mistakes that have very severe consequences. Climate is one uh, of uh, the subjects where these effects are felt. Uh, you heard about 1.2 degrees. 1.2 degrees does seem very little, but if you think about the 1.2 degree increase in the oceans, in the rocks, in the lands, we may generate too much energy <coughs> that may have uh, very dark consequences. El, el ser tanta gente requería dos cosas. Una, producir mucha comida. Of course, hecho, the population being so large required first to produce tremendos. lots of food, which an environmental impact, como se ve, la parte and with a huge energy consumption, as we can see here, carbón, this is the consumption of oil, coal and gas, la leña, pues biomass, traditional biomass, años, wood has remained stable for more than 200 years, but when we talk about fossil fuels, well, this led to the demographic explosion. 80% of the energy we use is generated through the burning of coal, gas and oil. Pero a eso, como sabemos, le hemos ido the natural casos, greenhouse effect is what made uh, life possible in, in la, in, on Earth. But, of course, uh, uh, temperature, temperature has increased uh, considerably as a result of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, we had an unprecedented number of heat waves, 46 in total. Many record temperatures were reached all over the world. But this is not going to last very long. There is a tension between the model of civilization and the natural limit of warming that this cannot last long. So the human humans have two options to act as if nothing happens, in which case things will continue as usual, or to Intentar que el colapso o try el golpe, to o los efectos colaterales de todo este clima prevent uh, the collapse o the collateral effects of these phenomena que son eh, en los dos sentidos tanto el cambio climático nos impacta a nosotros a los ecosistemas climate, como nosotros, nosotros, climate change nos impacts us and the ecosystems and as we move we also sentidos, have an impact on the, on the ecosystems and therefore on the climate so there are turning points, areas in the planet which seem very remote and one may think, well, I live in Madrid, why should I care about the coral reefs in Australia or the situation in the Atlantic Ocean, why should I care? There are 15 turning points, nine of which 
are very concerning because they are very active, which should uh, concern us because the coral reefs, the rainforests, many of these ecosystems determine the cycles of carbon, water, and climate in general. And these can generate a cascade effect. <coughs> and that's why they are so concerning about scientists, to scientists. This is the positive uh, feedback, which can be seen in the case of permafrost. This ground that are normally frozen permanently in the Arctic start uh, to melt, and once they melt, uh, they release greenhouse gases, which in turn generate greater, war, uh, greater warmth, more fusion, more melting, etc. So this is an example of these vicious circles. The average, uh, worldwide average is 1.2 degrees. The temperature increased, but in the Arctic it is 3.2 degrees. We've also changed the tilt axis of the Earth, changing the center of gravity as a result of the melting of this ice mass. It changes uh, the uh, axis of the Earth. But climate change goes much, much further than the consequences that were visible last year. These are the conflict and the major and minor wars and conflicts all over the world today, and which generate 125,000 deaths in a year. To these, we have to add 100,000 babies and 300,000 civilians who die as a result of wars and conflicts. So, all in all, half a million people die every year as a result of conflicts. Atmospheric pollution generates 9 million premature deaths a year. Climate change does not kill with some extreme event exception, but it has such a high influence on human activity that tens of millions of people die every year as a result of the effects of the climate change. Tens of millions versus 500,000. But what is the percentage of GDP that we allocate? 6% to armament, and the military, and less than 2% of GDP to climate change and the pollution that changes 100 times more uh, people. So we are investing more money on defending ourselves than on fighting the actual killers. In January, El País and the Washington Post published the, re the results of a research from the University of Harvard who said that ExxonMobil had already known about the effects of uh, global warming 80 years ago. So this is nothing new. But so it is a known fact that we were warm in the atmosphere, but the, the greenhouse effect is not the main culprit. The culprit is the fact that we have a, a made uh, energy supply a business. Of course, we need energy, but we don't need that much energy. Well, a lot of people have a, a, a struggle to try to pay the power bill. We have record profits among the power companies. <coughs> and there's also the government subsidies. Without the subsidies, the, the energy from burning oil is lower than the energy used in actually extracting those resources. 
And part of the taxes that people that citizens pay are allocated to this subsidy, and we continue to 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 to, to focus on fossil fuels, which are not profitable. So the scientists have determined what should be the level of fossil fuels consumption that we would need to forego to reach the one. 1.2% goal. No lo sé. Well, 60% en tensiones entre dos aguas. Por ejemplo, less oil and 80% less energías renovables. coal. Claro que hay que ir a las energías renovables. Of course we need renewable energies. Producing one watt of renewable energy has a much lower environmental impact. It's not zero, but it's much lower than burning fossil fuels to obtain the same watt of energy. But if we continue to think that everything is business, we are going to be caught between a rock and a hard place. La ciencia una vez más va dando pinceladas y, por ejemplo, necesitamos muy poca energía. Y esta es una buena noticia, salvo que trabajes en el sector energético. Y eso es una buena noticia, salvo que trabajes en el sector energético. Necesitamos la mitad, la mitad de la energía que producimos. Currently, 75 gigajoules per person per year to be healthy and happy, according to nine indicators. 75 gigajoules. En España, consumimos 150, dos veces más. So we have a lot of room for improvement. But what is the response from the renewables energy sector? Not to just be moderate in energy production. No, no. They focus on producing six to nine times more energy than we need. So the problem of climate change is not the greenhouse effect, but the fact that power is a, a business, not only power, but but uh, clothes and food, etc. Are we progressing in the climate change fights? Yes, we do. Some politicians say never in history has much uh, has so much done against climate change. But I would say to that, I would respond to that. Never in history has climate change been so so severe. Well, uh, human beings uh, are very good at adapting, but who can adapt better? Well, the, the developed world, the industrialized world, the upper classes. <coughs> but don't talk to adaptation uh, to Afghanistan or Pakistan. Mitigation, mitigation is fine, but the consumption of energy continues to grow. But Europe has called gas and nuclear energies green energies because they just change the names just to try to uh, paint a different picture, but they are equally green as they've ever been. So I don't know whether we can uh, overcome uh, this temptation. The more money we have, the poorer we are in environmental terms. We are against the ropes due to climate change and the degradation of the environment, and we are less healthy and less happy. Life expectancy has not grown for quite a while because of the degradation of the environment. Despite the medical advances, so life expectancy has not increased as a result. I think there's a great hypocrisy. Winston Churchill 
was very annoyed when the Nazi army was uh, invading Europe and, and the British Parliament uh, engaged in all the not so relevant topics of discussion. In the last intergovernmental panel on climate change, there are many mentions to what the described as the organized hypocrisy, many obstacles that prevent us from uh, reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement. Banking hypocrisy, the banks have made uh, this possible, not being aware of the fact that we are, they are funding the destruction of the environment. That's why we, the scientists, say that uh, uh, economic uh, slowdown equals prosperity. And in Latin America, this is known as uh, a good life because they get rid of historical debts that their countries cannot pay. Uh, with the economic slowdown, we would gain some time because capitalism has deprived us of, of one point and a half hours of sleep every day and many hours for our own self-care and development. One of the alliances for economic slowdown is the uh, prosumer, who is not only a consumer, but who also produces, produces care. For instance, we don't have time. So we uh, subcontract uh, uh, care of our children, of our elders. We are caught in a society which has accepted a model of growth, economic growth model, which is limitless, which is contrary to the limits of the planet, uh, generates climate change and stresses the inequalities among people. And this is not a religious, ethical, moral or ideological issue. It's a functional issue, a society with the levels of inequality <coughs> that could be more or less accepted or tolerated requires twice as much energy as an equalitarian society. So, changing the way we organize ourselves and balancing out the inequalities has objective advantages, uh, energy consumption, distribution of energy and happiness and health of the population, the sensibility of the citizens while the politicians try to represent ourselves very poorly and the big businesses do the business the citizens seem to be quite sensible about this the European survey asked whether they were in favor of economic slowdown 67% were in favor of uh, slowing down the economy because this is just uh, is the sensible thing to do. Agnes will tell us about the citizens' assemblies. And one of the things that was exposed as a result of these exercises was the sensibility of the citizens. <coughs> We are just uh, making a poor use of the social muscle of the citizens, the sensible people, and we are just uh, wasting uh, all of this capital. Is this a lost uh, battle? Because normally we are always thinking about who's right, who's wrong, who's the winner, who's the loser, but in, the, in climate change, everyone can lose. And, and, and we shouldn't use this uh, warlike uh, terms. This is not a battle. There are no winners or losers. We're all losers. Reversing climate change is possible, says, uh, say the scientists. But it is not easy because it requires to come into an agreement. Of course, we cannot just uh, reach an agreement overnight. Diversity is good, but we must find some 
que mínimo <coughs> ideas that we should all be in, in, in agreement with human rights. Well, uh, one of the most recent human rights is the human right to an environment which is clean and healthy. And this is a recent incorporation into the list of human rights. Uh, as a result of all of the problems of energy, climate, uh, health, uh, or social, these are not really, uh, but they are climate-related climate problems. So if we understand what it's at stake with respect to climate change and damaging nature, once we understand it, I think we will be more capable of changing the situation. Thank you. Well, Agnes, are you ready? Muy bien, cuando quieras. Floor is yours. Pues muchísimas gracias a Fernando Vallespín por su invitación. Fernando Valladares también por su invitación. Well, thank you for the invitation. Que nos ha aclarado en todos los aspectos sobre lo que estamos viviendo de manera más o menos consciente. Y creo que vais a recordar esa película, ¿no? No mires arriba. Don't Look Up, que se estrenó el año pasado. Y estamos en esa situación más o menos. Es una alegoría política, una sátira, pero realmente estamos en esa situación. Y uh, Fernando sería Leonardo DiCaprio. <risa> Salvando las distancias. <risa> Salvando las distancias, yo la doctora Ana. <risa> Entonces, uh, lo digo sonriendo, pero la realidad no es para nada amable, como lo ha dicho Fernando, es un riesgo de, de, muerte, de muerte sobre la especie de lo que estamos hablando. Yo voy a enfocar las soluciones, soluciones humanas a un problema humano con uh, consecuencias ambientales para todas las toda nuestra especie y todas las especies, ya que estamos en la sexta extinción masiva de este. Hoy no he podido estar con vosotros, lo, lo lamento mucho, uh, por un tema que voy a precisar un poco uh, lo que ha dicho Fernando Valistín, porque estamos de lleno en, en el tema central, que es la, uh, una macro huelga en Francia contra la uh, forma de las pensiones. Strike in uh, France uh, against the reform of the pension system, which brought together all citizens under the same uh, slogan, end of the world, end of the month. And this is a slogan that is very closely related to the democratic uh, crisis of the welfare state with the Uh, environmental crisis that we are discussing. So can we save democracy and save the planet at the same time? That is the question that I would like to raise. These are the dates of the strikes in France. Uh, la de Greenpeace. No sé si and a tweet from Greenpeace uh, France y la campaña de Greenpeace. Uh, ¿Qué le da a esa protesta sobre las pensiones un sentido plenamente ecológico? Which gives an environmental and democratic uh, sense to all of these protests. This is a quote from the spokesperson of Greenpeace France. During the last uh, presidential election campaign in 2022, Greenpeace said that the far right was as dangerous for democracy as it was for the climate. They're equally dangerous. And he connected the defense of representative democracy to the defense 
of the environment for the first time uh, it was explicitly expressed in a Greenpeace campaign. And uh, there was a new uh, definition of democracy as a result of environmental democracy that demands uh, the direct uh, participation of the citizens in the representative democracy. And he said, and I quote, given the current block, uh, blockage of uh, public action, we can only count on the citizens to avoid the disaster because they are they are brave and courageous contrary to the politicians. So they defended uh, some sort of a citizen's participation system within the parliamentary uh, representation system within the parliamentary system. This is where the so-called citizens' assemblies which are the demand not only of Greenpeace, but all of the environmental uh, organizations, not only in France, but elsewhere in Europe. What is a citizen's assembly? Let me explain that to you. Based on the Climate Citizens Assembly that was held uh, in between November 2021 and June 2022, very recently, uh, Citizens' Assembly is a group, a representative group, 100 people in Spain, 150 in France and UK, of different genders, age, uh, na nationality, that makes up a representative symbol of the population. This is not a new tool. It has been in, existing, in existence for 25 years. This is an institutionalized, not, as an, not an assembly like uh, a process. So, it is organized because it's organized by the government, but it has nothing to do with a survey. So they are not asked their opinion, as would be the case of a survey. It is a process based on learning, learning and training um, by experts. And let me explain the three phases of the organization of assistance assembly. It's a deliberation in three different phases. First, a phase of information in which citizens received, not only in Spain, but elsewhere, expert information, scientific information about the climate crisis in terms of biodiversity, food, the productive system, and Fernando Valladares can tell us about it because he participated directly as an expert in this experience of participative democracy in Spain. He participated as a scientist and other associations and militants and trade unions participated as well. So the citizens receive information and then deliberate. They can request uh, uh, the input from other experts. And then finally, they propose resolutions which are voted upon. These are the three phases of uh, the citizens assembly which uh, uh, represents the core of uh, citizens' participation. And citizens' participation is not a consultation. It's a process of learning that allows for the transformation 
of those who participate on it because they, it transforms their opinion and all of the participants uh, say that they suffered some sort of a shock because no one wants to, no one feels comfortable hearing the harsh truth behind the climate situation. And scientists now claim that in 50 years, the temperature of the planet could rise by four degrees, which would be really catastrophic for mankind. And the citizens who participate in this process of participative democracy hear these harsh truths from the scientists themselves. So the next question I would like to raise is what can 100 or 150 citizens do against this climate crisis which leads us to a suicidal path, in the words of Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, for mankind. Is it possible for mankind to save itself and to save the planet at the same time? <clears throat> because that is the central idea of what political scientists call environmental democracy. So that these citizens' assemblies can be the main lever for action, for the social democracy, and for environmental action as an institutionalized counterpower to the lobbies, to the industrial and the energy lobbies. Because, as Valladares has said, the problem is that energy is a business. And I would like to take this opportunity to say that we really have to debunk the fallacy that climate change is anthropogenic. Of course, the origin is, is human, is the result of human actions, but the responsibilities, responsibility lies on a very small part of mankind, the big polluters. 90 companies which have produced 75% of the greenhouse effect gases in the last 50 years. And there are the big five, Exxon, and four others. This, they have organized not uh, hyper, uh, hypocritical uh, stand, but according to the IPCC, the main cause of the increase in temperatures is the interaction between power politics and economy. This is crucial and to explain why this wide compromise does not only does not always translate into urgent action. One of the factors limiting the ambition of climate policy has been the capacity of the industries affected to shape the government action on climate change. And this is the cause of the current emergency, this suicidal path. And IPCC, apart from diagnosing the problem, proposes 
problems, uh, uh, proposes solutions, political solutions. The scientists of the IPCC demand a change in paradigm. A transition based on the democratization of the climate action. We must uh, democratize climate action urgently, and citizens' assemblies are one of the most uh, privileged tools to advance towards uh, more democracy in the climate action. So, I'm going to just summarize the conclusions of the three citizens' assemblies that were organized in Europe uh, uh, after the climate emergency declarations of countries around the world. These are the countries which have declared uh, a climate emergency since 2018. In Europe, three countries, UK, France, and Spain, were the first to declare the climate emergency. UK and France in 2019, and Spain in 2020. And the three, these three countries have uh, organized these climate assemblies as a place of democratic uh, 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 discussion. In London, in 2018, a group of militants blocked uh, London with, through massive demonstrations demanding climate action. And the, in, in France, the Yellow Jackets uh, protested for one year against ecological transition without social justice, not without, not against ecologic transition, but an ecological transition that would uh, 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 continue to protect the industry and suffocate the middle classes. In Spain, we you did not have this social protest, but Spain also joined the European movement in January 2020. This is the website, website of the Spanish government. And this was one of the main uh, uh, compromises acquired by the current government. A uh, commitment to reach net uh, zero net emissions, decarbonization, adaptation to climate change, and to promote mechanisms uh, for the participation of citizens in the climate action. These were the measures that were announced uh, on January 21, 2020, right before the pandemic. And in France, and in the UK, these assemblies were held, but in Spain, this had to wait until the end of the pandemic. Out of the three assemblies, the one that has the lesser uh, social and political impact is the Spanish assembly. I don't know whether we have any experts on this topic, but who has heard about these assemblies? Very few people, really. And whenever I ask who has seen uh, an information campaign on the media, no one has, because no such campaign took place in Spain. Whenever I ask who has read uh, the uh, statements of the participants in these assemblies that took place in uh, France and the UK? No one has. And whenever I ask a more nagging question, who has seen the main ecological ecologist uh, uh, organizations in Spain, Greenpeace, WW, 
F, amigos de la tierra, eh, supports these uh, democratic assembly processes. No one has, because the Spanish environmentalist movement has turned its back on uh, citizens' participation. And this is not my opinion. This is documented in a, a report published by the Konama Foundation in 2020 when they were organizing these citizens' assemblies. They asked the NGOs and the unions and they asked them the following question. Do you think that a citizens' assembly should make its decisions binding. Most uh, responded that there was another preferable option so that the decisions of the citizens' assemblies should not be binding when it came to climate action. This is quite interesting because apparently uh, citizens are not really willing to change the model, despite the fact that all of the surveys seem to indicate that everyone is aware of the, of the severity of a climate crisis. So this is an expression of the reluctance of citizens to accept a more ambitious environmental policy. Why do environmentalists do not believe in citizens' participation? Well, because they think it is some sort of a trick to play down the role of the third sector in the public decision-making process in negotiations with government. So it's, uh, in other words, it would be some sort of a way to bypass uh, these uh, movements. And I think this explains a phenomenon that it happened only in Spain, not in the UK and France, because in these two countries, the environmentalists really uh, supported citizens' participation thanks to the impulse of the citizens. So this is a quite a singularity, voluntary desertion of the militants uh, on, on citizens' participation. In the UK and France, uh, these initiatives have been very, very promising. Bruyère uh, Latour, a great environmental philosopher, in his last book called Memo for a New Ecological Class, how to support the emergence of a ecological class that is aware and proud of itself. He defined the climate town. The climatic town is the silent majority of Spaniards, 83%, who are aware of everything that Fernando Valladares has mentioned, the gravity, uh, the serious nature of the climate, the threats and the deadly threat that it represents for our survival, but which is no, not represented by any political party or social actor directly, and which does not have its own space in the current representative system. This is a book written together with Nicholas Schultz, political scientist, who, which discusses how can the democracy reshape itself against the climate change based on the demos, the people, more demos for environmental democracy. And Latour says that this is possible in new political spaces those of participative democracy, which uh, fit together within representative democracy because 
this is not a green Soviet, it is not given power to citizens' assemblies, but some sort of a co-governance between an our participative body as made of citizens and uh, the representative dem democracy. And this is no utopia, because uh, Chile, in its new constitution, it's uh, incorporating this into its new constitution. The connection between representative democracy and participative democracy, they are creating an uh, environmental uh, rule of law state, as they call it. This could be the political space that we urgently need to resolve the problems that Fernando Valladares has described to build a counter power, a counterweight to the hegemony of, uh, polit uh, of political parties. Even though the Chilean constitution was rejected in the current uh, draft, citizens' participation is the backbone of the new constitution, which is environmental, ecological, participative, which is uh, the constitution of a state, will be the constitution of a state that is post... Uh, uh, productivist. Uh, let me finish mentioning the actual impact of the citizens' assemblies in France and in Spain, despite the lack of visibility that I've mentioned. In France, seven out of every ten citizens have heard about the climate assembly and 70% of uh, those support the conclusions. This is an unprecedented event because this is not the result of a campaign, of a awareness raising campaign or a campaign uh, sponsored by Greenpeace. No, this is the outcome of these uh, citizens' assemblies which has created this new space which has changed a lot among citizens, among environmental organizations, but also among uh, companies, because uh, after the success of the Citizens' Assembly in France and the very uh, brave measures uh, proposed, well, uh, the multinationals panicked and uh, uh, organized a lobbying campaign to slow down uh, the uh, proposals uh, put forth by the uh, French citizens' assemblies to slow down the process of uh, discussion and approval in, in Parliament. And this has uh, shown how uh, the citizen assemblies have this weakness. They need uh, to have a mechanism that would make their resolutions binding. But at the same time, it has proven that uh, there is a space for deliberation outside of the influence of these uh, <coughs> big companies. So I think this is an unprecedented uh, uh, initiative which has proven its uh, efficacy uh, and has put an end to the feedback loop between the lobbies and the national parliaments in Spain. Nonetheless, the 172 measures proposed by the Assembly have uh, received uh, very little coverage, but there have been many more Assemblies, one in Barcelona, 
another one in Mallorca, and I will talk about the latter. The Mallorca Assembly published its uh, resolutions just last week. An unprecedented emergency deserves an unprecedented assembly. That is the slogan. 93% of the European citizens consider that climate change is the most serious problem that we face. So based on this, they organized a citizens' assembly that has published its uh, conclusions, but contrary to the state assemblies, the organizers, the uh, Consejo de Baleares, have undertaken to, to uh, propose to Parliament 30% uh, of the proposals put forward. So, I think this proves that we can uh, do away with the paralysis pro proposed or favored by the lobbyists through the citizens' uh, participation. Fernando Valladares has talked about the very poor process of transition to renewable energies, which is hindered by the speculation of uh, the industry, whereas uh, Citizens' Assembly allows for the formation of an independent uh, social council. The first uh, proposal is to limit the number of visitors arriving in Mallorca. This was supported by 93% of the members of the Assembly to promote the model of a 15-minute city, relocating services and promoting collective modes of transport versus private um, uh, vehicles. 100% of the members of the Assembly supported the promotion of a model of transition towards renewable energies that would uh, uh, support uh, the creation of uh, cooperatives that would protect the rural spaces. Another proposal Promo uh, favors the installation of uh, uh, P uh, solar energy in rural areas uh, with a high biodiversity values. Uh, let me finish talking about something and which is not energy, the war of the sirloin. Last year in Spain there was uh, the so-called war of the sirloin because many uh, sectors complained about the impossibility to implement the uh, proposals that come uh, that uh, come from a citizens uh, assembly and these are the conclusions of the citizens uh, in Europe about the consumption of meat. And that's why this was called the T-bone steak war. 40% approved to reduce uh, the consumption of meat in the UK. The same applies to France. The citizens also supported uh, 
the, the reduction in the consumption of meat, reducing the farming sector, and they also proposed the renegotiation of the free trade CETA agreement. In Spain, they've also approved measures to support extensive farming and, um, and uh, measures to reduce the consumption of, of meats because Spain is the uh, number one consumer of meat in Europe. So all of these assemblies have uh, demonstrated that they are quite uh, efficient and uh, to, to overcome the polarization of the lobbies and the industry. The, uh, the assemblies have proven to be very uh, efficient as well in other social uh, topics such as abortion in Ireland, which was approved as a result of the support of the citizens in, uh, to, to approve uh, an abortion uh, law on a traditionally very religious country, which nonetheless uh, uh, accepted the conclusions of this uh, uh, debate. Jorge Reichman says, what is environmentally necessary is politically impossible. And I think this is something that we need to tackle we believe that uh, what is environmentally necessary can be rebuilt uh, with the support of the citizens and reconstructing our uh, poorly damaged bueno, pues, democracies. Eh, okay, thank you very Pero much, Agnes. Dos, dos visiones, we la, have heard la que tiene two que la amenaza, visions, y otra, one about the threats con, con and the poder, other about the poder, possibilities para, of uh, amenaza, por lo menos uh, investing eh, bueno, temas, the necessary podemos, resources to podemos, reduce that Eh, pero me gustaría dar la palabra al público, primero aquí a los que están presentes y si no, acudimos a los de a los so que están presentes So we are going to open the floor for sí. questions. Espera un segundo que, que te traen un... Just wait for the microphone. Hola, bueno, pues muchas gracias. Well, thank Yo you very much. Yo lo que quería preguntar es que aquí no ha salido... Eh, bueno, por ejemplo, cuando hablamos del decrecimiento, eh, incluso about, uh, de la Asamblea Ciudadana, buscamos, estamos hablando de, de temas nacionales, mientras que el cambio climático es algo internacional. Eh, por ejemplo, con el decrecimiento tiene mucho sentido en los países ricos, pero una de las cuestiones uh, y, y, y críticas es que, bueno, hay miles de millones de, de, de ciudadanos en el mundo que realmente no están emitiendo eh, gases de efecto invernadero y que no consumen. Many countries in the world are not producing greenhouse gas emissions, but they continue to consume. So the question is, to what extent is it possible to reach a global uh, agreement on this, on this uh, topic? Okay, let's take uh, questions one at a time, please. Of course, economic slowdown is easier said than done. The European Union has just approved the funding of a project to implement implement economic uh, slowdown. 
And I've y said that años diciendo, no es una cosa I've de described de, that que entra as del, del the European Union is opening its eyes, finally. <coughs> Because the European Union has eh, realized that the limits of the planet are real. En el It's true that no not all, all countries are in the same o sea, situation. Economic slowdown is not applicable to all. Under si equal esto, conditions, aquí, si allá, ¿no? uh, politicians are used to contemplate todos, scenarios, and the best uh, possible no scenario requires si something hacemos, that we are not very uh, good at, but if una, we succeed, it's a real chance. Some say that it is possible to eradicate extreme sin, poverty eh, of one billion people with just uh, decir, emitting 1.6% of the current emissions. Eh, so we can favor the development of one billion people without uh, leaving uh, a great uh, uh, imprint es que on the planet. But for that, Uh, we will have to do something that we are not very good at, which is transferring technology, as uh, it has been clearly proven by COVID. Despite the threat of, of the virus, uh, we did not really succeed in the transfer of technology. Then we have the more pessimistic scenarios, every man for himself, and in the middle we have the more likely scenarios transfer some technology, but we should not, we should stop thinking that we have to uh, give money to uh, the poor countries. economists who work in it aprovechan the salida of all the recessions para entender cómo funciona una economía economist analyze recessions to understand how an economy recovers after an economic crisis after a crisis for one or two years all of the governments um, relax the, the economic measures to prevent uh, to, to, to allow people to, to recover, and that gives us uh, uh, some indication of what are the effects of uh, slowing down the, the economy. Because we could maybe calculate how much should we, de de siglo de, should we downturn the economy. To just maintain the same GDP, despite the fact that GDP is not directly related with human well-being, welfare. Permitiría transitar por una Growing, senda, entre otras cosas, mitigaría significativamente el cambio climático. Es que además, mejorarían aspectos sociales, 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 mejorarían aspectos which have just uh, lost uh, 16 million people because of the debt uh, they were unable to pay and the lack of food. So uh, this imbalance between the North and the South is unsustainable, not only for ethical reasons of justice, but for purely mathematical reasons. We have squeezed so much the countries of the South that they cannot be squeezed anymore. Uh, they cannot pay their debts especially after COVID, so should we just uh, swap debt for climate, or should we just uh, pardon them the, the, the debt? So there are many options. 
y los pobres son mucho más pobres. Estas to do something about it because the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. So we cannot maintain uh, these tensions much longer because it is unsustainable from all points of view. That's why the, the economic downturn is much more valuable than people think. Because at the end of the day, uh, the economic downturn would uh, equal uh, an increase in improvement of uh, human rights. Of course, if you want to make a comment, Agnes, feel free to take the floor. Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, yo lo que iba más es, claro, en esta en este nuevo intento político de, de crecimiento, claro, tiene que haber una alianza well, o una concienciación masiva. In order to ¿no? achieve this downturn, there must be, uh, I mean, everyone seem, needs to be in agreement. There must be a global eh, agreement, but how can we de que no contemplate these si scenarios without harming esto. people. I'm y a y teacher myself, and I, when I talked about this with my uh, students, they ejemplo, just lose interest. But if you give them some solo, hope, uh, the ozone layer hole has improved. And this is what really attracts their attention, the positive news, the good news. So how can we balance, how can we reach a balance between all of these negative uh, realities uh, on the one hand and uh, the fact that uh, hope is, is necessary? Yes, this is a very good question. I have a, t a, a radio show with 60 episodes in which I try to accum accumulate reasons for being optimistic. And I describe solutions, successful solutions, uh, neighbors in a district in London who have had a positive impact on the urbanism of the city and they have made London a healthier city as a result or small uh, affordable technologies which have uh, made it possible to to have uh, uh, to, to install lights, electric lights in uh, in some cities in Sierra Leona, for instance. Well, there are good examples that we need to disseminate. How do doctors tell a patient about a serious disease, or how can how to deal with the victims of, a, of an earthquake uh, like the recent one in Turkey and Syria, how to tell someone who has lost, uh, how to break the news to someone who's lost uh, their family. Of course, not everyone needs the same level or can afford to receive the same level of information that it depends on your level of education, on your free time, etc. But I think citizens have a right to know. And truth can be very harsh, but there are good news. We can, we can put out millions of people out of poverty. Some, Agnes has given us some good exa examples of the successful uh, effects of these, of these uh, citizens' assemblies. Of course, there are good examples that can be used to motivate them. The problem is the balance between the seriousness of the situation, because if we are over-optimistic, people will think, oh, well, that is no longer a problem. Renewable energies, for instance, of course we need renewable energies. And they have lower footprint, but when people think, oh, renewable energy is okay, uh, the problem is gone. 
comprobándose como peligrosos también. But uh, es, renewable es energies y si estás en uh, la docencia, uh, have their dangers as, as well and do their que, damage. Que, so que we have to be very careful. Clave, no, no en el we must la, not be tonterías. overly pessimistic either. So maybe we could replace economic downturn with a good life. Especially in South America, they suffered the consequences of a debt they could not afford to repay, and they know that working less instead of working more equals good life. And when you prove to them that it is possible to work less, well, that's a good side of oh, a downturn, even though downturn does not sound a very positive. A politician who would promise uh, their citizens, we are going to downturn the economy by decrease the economy by 17 percent well that sounds like a failure instead of a success extractos de las sesiones del congreso de diputados no expresiones como eso es volver a la caverna because uh, many will say that it's just like going back to living in the caves and in poverty which is absolutely not true so we really need to think about how to, to, to tell people about this uh, phenomenon is not going from Macintosh to PC to IBM changing the operating system. We don't have an, a complete alternative to the prevailing socioeconomic system, but we have some pieces that could be replaced. That's why we have to be prosumers producers and consumers, and we have to be proactive to change. And we have to have a clear idea of why are we going to do it? Why should we make the effort? Well, because it's very exciting and because there's a lot to gain. And there's also the fact that we feel part of a moment in history and despite uh, the modesty of our own actions, if we put them together, we can all uh, create a, um, a different reality, a different uh, world. Well, I'll be very brief because Fernando has uh, talked about his experience as a, as a professor and how to keep uh, the hope among uh, uh, his students. But even my children, they tell me, well, the damage is done, mommy. And it's true. But as a researcher, I work on the topic of uh, uh, decrease, economic decrease, among those who do not want to hear it. And these are the CEOs. But in France, but not only in France, in Davos, there was a session on economic uh, downturn or decrease. Well, this is really a sign that uh, things are changing because the data are real and economy is just an analysis of uh, the data. Either you forge the data or you analyze the data. And for a CEO, well, a CEO of a company, they they all have the data. So, in the temple of the liberal economy in France, equivalent to the, uh, the most important business school in France, the opening session of last year's was uh, a lecture on economic decrease 
and and companies what what kind of uh, business is possible with a certain degree of economic decrease it is not a matter of changing from one operating system to another as fernando said but even in those uh, sectors in which economic decrease sounds like an absolute no no they are starting to to discuss uh, the possibilities of doing business in a, a scenario in which the economy is decreasing. And that was the opening session of the most important business school in France. So maybe in two, three years, there will be a chair of economic decrease. Who knows? And, and this is a reality in, in, in other countries. So I think there is hope. Fenomenal, sí. Eh, bueno, eh, os transmito algunas, algunas de estas preguntas. Well, we have some, eh, a few questions lugar, from una, the una uh, streaming eh, audience. Uno de los miembros del público online se pregunta eh, qué podemos esperar del What llamado can hidrógeno verde. Expect si se trata de una energía verdaderamente prometedora from a green hydrogen. Is this a, a, a real alternative? Well, hydrogen as such is not a form of energy. It's a form of transporting energy. Hydrogen has many different colors, and this is creating some confusion because it should only have two colors. Colors, green, green, which means that the way you produce this hydrogen is uh, through with renewable and sustainable energies, and the non-green hydrogen, which is the one produced burning uh, fossil fuels. But we have a range of different colors to hydrogen, nine different colors. This, I think, a way of concealing the dirty side of, of hydrogen. Hydrogen can be a factor in energy transition, especially uh, in the as a form of transporting energy. You create hydrogen with uh, uh, renewable energies and if you can use hydrogen as a fuel in on planes, on airplanes, where weight is a factor. But uh, it is not a miracle solution. There's always a lot of hype about new technology. So hydrogen can be useful, but is not uh, a, a solution for all of our problems. And do not fall into the trap of the different colors. There's only green and non-green hydrogen. Well, I'm the political scientist here, as you know, so let me ask a question about politics. Well, the idea of the assemblies is a very good one, and he has in, they have worked very well in Ireland. It was a success. Uh, in the discussion about the, the abortion. This is a form of what uh, we political scientists talk, uh, refer to as a mixed uh, democracy, as another form of democracy, apart from uh, casting uh, votes. Uh, I was, uh, some years ago, uh, the chairman of the CIS, the president of the CIS, and we made, uh, we organized uh, some sort of an assembly similar to the Citizens' Assembly. You take a sample of citizens and you subject them to a survey and, and you take a smaller sample of these citizens 
le explicas le... Sí. llegan expertos eh, con, con, accommodate eh, them in a hotel cosa, over a weekend ellos. and they Luego, receive information from experts and, and the groups uh, uh, the group of citizens interact between them and right after that you uh, run the same survey and the results are completely different the problem with surveys is that we are asked for opinions about topics that we don't have an opinion about some people say well i don't believe in climate change well it's, it's not a matter of believing it's knowing or not knowing well so these type of mechanisms are very useful but this work funciona en la medida en que eh, se queda ahí en un experimento de académicos ¿no? in as far as it is limited to uh, an academic exercise but it does not they do not work when the decisions of these groups of citizens are binding and has an immediate effect so it's equivalent to a political decision. This must be done. What I'm trying to say is that deliberating is one thing, but being aware of the fact that our decisions will have an impact in the real world is uh, something different. 90% of, of the citizens of Mallorca decide that uh, uh, tourism should be limited to the island. The number of visitors should be reduced. If this translates into a marked reduction of tourism on, to the island, then you will have those citizens who will mobilize themselves to try to uh, reverse that decision. So Mallorca would uh, reduce its uh, GDP as a result of the reduction of tourism, obviously. But the problem of politics is that uh, these interests, which are clearly common in interest uh, create unexpected conflicts because the problem here is asymmetry. It cannot fall equally into the burden, into, onto the shoulders of all citizens. And this requires that the state sees to it that this is uh, actually uh, complied with through taxes, etc. So there's a lot to do in this respect. And then there's something else that is normally disregarded. The chance. In Germany, for instance, there is a huge contradiction in the Green Party, which has arrived in the government, and as a consequence of the war in Ukraine, they have to recommission coal plants and burn coal again, and whereas they wanted the completely the, the opposite thing. So, how can we um, how can we balance the different asymmetries all over the world, but within our own countries as well. I have a very few wild uh, proposals. We tend to escalate uh, political structures and decision-making processes hierarchically. You have a mayor, you have a provincial, the, uh, and then the regional, uh, regional presidents and the national presidents. But, and we would logically need a president of the world, if you see what I mean. 
but this is not the way things work, work because the hierarchical model has its limitations. So I propose other wild alternatives based on the way decisions are made in non-human groups. For instance, the sparrows, they fly in coordination, 200,000 individuals flying at the same time, synchronizing their flight without any boss, and no bird being the, the boss. And the rules that they use are um, incredibly efficient. So this is somehow an analogy to rely on people's sensibility. People do not understand everything, but a hundred people taken chosen randomly, which I think are trustworthy, could produce very complex and sophisticated global behaviors which are not just a mere result of the combination of all the individuals. There are mathematical tools that are uh, uh, researching this type of uh, decision-making in small groups. We need four basic rules and uh, come to an agreement on the final uh, goals. And then some processes are launched and they operate without the need to rely on prior experiences. This worked before in the past during the Inca Empire or during the French Revolution. No, no, these are new experiments in new situations, new circumstances. There's never been 8 billion people in the world before and we've never had uh, these uh, type of mechanisms uh, we never put them in operation instead well we must change our minds and that's true but that's not sufficient we have to uh, acquire a, an attitude that favors change and we don't have that yet when we acquire that attitude we will be much more open to other unprecedented and radical solutions. There is a risk of failing, of course, but there are scenarios which are pointing at uh, the failure of humanity. So when you face failure, you become more courageous. Bravery is not part of any political party a platform, but political bravery boils down to the risk of not being elected. Not many are willing to take that risk. So we really need to have politicians who are not afraid of not being reelected. So people will start relying and trusting politicians who do not want to to be re-elected, and this will change the way things are done. That generates trust among the people, and without a boss, without a structure, without a rule of law and a functional democracy, some behaviors uh, start to develop just like the sparrows who fly together. And I think uh, these uh, assemblies are not really relying on the fact that their proposals are binding or not. Once the assembly has uh, reached a resolution and once this has reached the, uh, the public opinion, this, has, this is just out of the hands of Macron, who has opened a Pandora's box and has found out 
paneles fotovoltaicos. Propuestas no son más que abrámonos en sus manos desconocidos. <coughs> Y démosle so let's open our minds to unexplored unexplored possibilities uh, and unprecedented changes. El gran sentido eh, no lo van a participar en el sentido de un colectivo de personas que no tienen intereses propios en que eso salga blanco o negro, sino que salga lo que parezca más sensato. Shown by a group of people. <laughs> well, Agnes, uh, we're out of time, <laughs> but uh, uh, you can just uh, <laughs> uh, have a last uh, intervention. Well, I'm sorry I have not been able to be there in Madrid. I did not really understand very well what you've said, but let me say that since I am not a bird, I'm a recent uh, political subject. 80 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to vote. Fernando, ¿me oís? Sí, 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 muy bien. Todo bien, te escuchamos. Y la historia de la democracia también es la de sujetos políticos también para First, with the universal suffrage that includes women in, in France that came very late in 1944. So, with the Citizens' Assembly, we have the same class prejudices as we had with uh, uh, vote of women. There is a class prejudice that uh, people will ignore. They will not measure the serious consequences of reducing uh, the number of tourists visiting Mallorca. So this type of prejudice, the women will not be able to vote, they will not know how to vote because they are illiterate, they are not full, full uh, political subjects. We find the same kind of reluctance to assistance assemblies. But the deliberative democracy demonstrates its efficiency when it takes place under minimum uh, conditions of stability. That was the reason for the success of the assemblies in France and the UK because it exceeded the expectations. It's not a green Soviet, as I've said before. It's co-governance. In other words, a tandem between the representative system and the participative system. And the Council of Europe uh, has placed a great uh, hopes on, on this process the Council of Europe has uh, concluded uh, has uh, concluded that these uh, assemblies should be binding. So Papandreou and the Council of Europe propose, recommend that these uh, uh, assemblies are given a true co-governance a given binding power and they are the main the, the main solution proposed by the Council of Europe to overcome uh, this situation. Well, thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Agnes.